the thing that tells us. Oh, does that mean it's on television? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> it is, uh, my watch says July 2nd. Is that correct? Yeah. July 2nd, meeting of the City of Palo Alto's Historic Resources Board um, in the old room. Brings back memories from 20 years ago. Oh, we have an agenda. Okay. Um, would you like to call roll? One of you like to call roll, or do I call roll? Um, Jack Here. Vice Chair McKinney. Here. Board Member Bernstein. Here. Board Member Bernstein. Here. Board Member Bonnegar. Here. Board Member Bonnegar. Here. Board Member Bonnegar. Great. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is, was, as noted, July 2nd's meeting of the Historic Resources Board. We're in the old room here that we used to uh, meet in uh, years ago because the council chambers are um, being reworked. I don't know what that means, but we'll see. Uh, um, so today we have Stephen Turner, Advanced Planning Manager uh, on the far end of the table. Diana Tamale, our administrative associate, is handling the computers. And um, so then we have any agenda changes, deletions, we don't, I don't think. Oh, oral communications. Yeah, I jumped over that. Does anyone here like, would you like to? <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, any agenda changes? I don't think so. There are none. Um, board item is general discussion with the HRB on historic matters, including but not limited to upcoming City Council HRB joint meeting. And that's one. And then Professor Design, Professor Veal Design Guidelines. And then an overview of recent historic training, discussions of matters related to the Historic Preservation Ordinance, and other issues related to historic preservation and the HRB. And then after that, we'll have board. So, so general discussion is that, are you leading us off? Yes, I can kick uh, that off. Stephen Turner, Advanced Planning Manager. Uh, it's nice to see the board again. Our last meeting was in April, uh, in the springtime. Uh, and um, the historic preservation activities within the city uh, have been busy, uh, albeit at a staff level. Um, we are dealing with uh, projects at a, at a minor level and um, we don't have uh, particular projects or at least haven't had particular projects uh, be ready for board review for a number of months now. Uh, as you'll see later on in our discussion uh, that will be changing soon. Um, we have a number of projects that will be, be coming before the board uh, at the <coughs> second half of the year. So we expect uh, board uh, activity to pick up uh, quite a bit. Um, I wanted to go over a few of the topics that I thought that we could discuss today, and uh, I've put them up on the uh, on the screen. Uh, we're certainly not limited to these topics, but we can talk about uh, anything that the board may want to. Um, we did want to acknowledge Dennis Bennett, uh, Dennis Backlund's retirement, uh, and the effect of his retirement on the program. Uh, we'll then go into talking about a joint meeting between the Historic Resources Board and the City Council, which is tentatively scheduled for September 22nd, and we can talk about how we might prepare for that meeting. 
Uh, third, uh, an update and next steps on the professor bill design guidelines uh, and uh, hopefully some tasks to move uh, that effort forward. I'll go over a list of upcoming projects uh, that will be coming before the board shortly. Uh, and then finally, uh, there was a request by the city clerk's office for HRB member biographies. This is uh, an effort related to um, promoting the, each of the city's boards and commissions in a more active way and really thanking individual board members throughout the city for their service. Um, the city really wants to acknowledge all of the time and effort that volunteers give to the city, especially on our boards and commissions. And um, so there is a uh, desire to really highlight and promote uh, those volunteers, including yourself. Um, and then we'll have uh, 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 an item that will be uh, just for open discussion on any topic that any of the board members may want to begin. So um, the uh, first item to discuss is Dennis Backlund's <coughs> retirement. Um, this, as I mentioned in our announcement, the city is, is delighted but um, disheartened to um, have Dennis retire. I think everybody understands and realizes that Dennis is uh, such uh, a uh, a valuable asset to to the city in terms of historic preservation. You know, I always comment that there is probably no one else in the city that knows the city as well as Dennis Backlund does in terms of its history and its buildings. Uh, it's certainly a loss for the program, but a benefit for Dennis. Uh, I think also everybody knows that Dennis puts in an extraordinary amount of time to prepare for HRB meetings, uh, for the analysis of his projects. Um, he is uh, very much committed to historic preservation and to the historic preservation program in Palo Alto. And frankly, we will not find anybody who can fill his shoes. Um, there's just, there's, that's just not possible. Um, so we have to certainly honor Dennis's participation and, and contributions to the city. We hope to do that in a, in a fun way, uh, both through the department uh, and I would imagine that the Historic Resources Board may want to um, celebrate Dennis uh, in, in a way that uh, Dennis is comfortable with, um, but I know that he uh, certainly would like to uh, share this special moment with, with you and, and others uh, at a time I think that works better for him, um, as one could imagine, of, of entering retirement. Um, it is uh, a change uh, in, in lifestyle, uh, and uh, so he, Dennis is dealing with, with all, of, all of the things that go along with that, so as soon as Dennis is ready, we'll be happy to, to celebrate him and, and move forward. Uh, I wanted to speak a little bit about how we move on from here, from, from the Maybe program. Just oh, yes. Too. Sure. Uh, uh, Dennis, if you're out there watching, uh, we have a photograph I've enlarged of uh, you um, at the Presidio conference we went to several years ago, and we are all putting our little notes on here, and we'll get this over to you at some point. Could probably leave it for staff to sign if they'd like to do that. Yeah, I think so. Um, so, so thank you, Dennis. I don't know which camera? <laughs> It's probably right there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's this a weird. One, this camera here is shaking its head. On <laughs> I don't see any lights on, so I don't know if. We're, I think we're. I, open, I don't yes. think we're on. Uh, no, it's moving. It's on air. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, that okay. On. Okay. Only, All right. Good. Well, thank you very much, Chair Kohler. Um, I'm sure Dennis uh, would appreciate that. Um, so uh, certainly, well, we will be hiring for Dennis's position. Um, we, we will. Uh, we are starting the recruitment process, although the the position has not yet been posted. Um, we will be starting that soon, uh, and uh, we'll be looking for somebody who can come and take over um, the the legacy that he's left behind. Certainly, if you have. Um, uh, candidates who you think uh, would work well uh, for the city, um, then I would encourage you uh, to talk with them and, and ask them to apply once the position is open. Um, we expect to have a very robust recruitment process. Uh, this is such an important program to the city. Uh, it provides a valuable service to the public, and we want to make sure we get the right person uh, on board. Uh, yes, does, uh, 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 Stephen. Stephen, does the uh, applicant need to be a resident of Palo Alto for that no, position? No, okay. no, it's uh, it's completely open. Okay, thanks. Um, so, um, uh, you know, this is also an opportunity, I, I think, uh, to uh, look at uh, the historic preservation itself in terms of the staff. 
uh, uh, the, the staffing and the uh, processing of of applications uh, in the city uh, for for historic review. Um, this could be another future discussion topic with the HRB uh, about the internal staff process for historic review. Um, when we get somebody new on board, um, they'll have to learn certainly about the processes and if there is a, a sense that there should be some adjustment in the way the program is run, uh, we would certainly like to get the HRB's opinion about some changes we can make that this seems like the, the right time to, to get off on a, on, a, on a good foot and a good start. Yes. We're uh, thank you again, Stephen. The, uh, would the interview process might it include that um, different applicants uh, make any presentations or comments directly to the HRB and HRB agenda? Uh, that is a possibility. Uh, I would imagine that through the interview process, it would be helpful to have an HRB member sit in on um, uh, on the interviews at the very least. Uh, but if the board feels that that would be an important uh, component of the selection process is to per have them perhaps present to the HRB that that is that that could be valuable so we will keep the HRB up to date with regards to Dennis's um, well the, the the recruitment for Dennis's position uh, and let you know how that is going um, we want to have somebody uh, as soon as possible uh, I wouldn't expect that we will have a permanent person until the fall given the application process uh, the interview schedule the city has a formal new employee orientation program that happens once per month and the policy of the city is that no empl new employee can start until they go through that recruitment so or that uh, that new employee orientation program uh, so uh, it does it can add on a number of weeks after after somebody is hired before they officially start with with the city um, so I don't suspect that uh, we'll have anybody uh, in place until uh, probably the fall uh, most likely September at the at the very earliest uh, any other questions uh, about Dennis or the historic program uh, from staffing side so yes. Stephen how many people are, are working with you now on historic um, project review well, um, it's a combination of folks. Um, we do have some staff that uh, have experience with historic preservation. Uh, our planning technician, Rena Shaw, over at the Development Center, actually sits on the City of Saratoga's Historic uh, Review Board. Uh, and she has been able uh, to provide us guidance with regard to um, relatively straightforward projects. Um, and uh, we also utilize the services of our architectural consultant, um, Arnold Mamorella, through the individual review program. Um, he has experience reviewing projects against the secretary's standards as they relate to uh, single family uh, individual review. Uh, and so he's been able to provide us uh, advice. We also have the services of on-call cons uh, planning consultants whose firms uh, employ or have sub-consultants relating to historic preservation. So for larger projects, we have the ability to bring in a consultant that has historic preservation experience that can peer review reports, that can provide uh, secretary standards findings, uh, and then present those to the HRB. So we have a number of people that I think are trying to fill Dennis's shoes at the at the moment. Um, so I think that will be, um, I think we'll be pretty good for at least the next few months or so with regards to uh, individual project review. Thank you. Okay, um, what's general discussion, announcements, or? Oh, well, we can uh, move on to the, the next topic um, that I had identified. Okay. Uh, the uh, joint city council HRB meeting, which is tentatively scheduled for September 22nd. Okay. Um, we have uh, attempted to have a joint meeting with the City Council for some time, but due to their yeah. agenda scheduling, um, oftentimes the, the joint meetings uh, are the first meetings to get postponed in order to accommodate other agenda items. Uh, but um, we think that the September 22nd meeting um, is uh, is a definite meeting with the City Council, again, barring any last minute changes. Is that a Monday night? Or that? that would be a Monday night. So it'll be at night? It would be at night. Uh, uh, usually it's about 6 p.m. Sometimes they start the um, joint meetings at 5 o'clock, but uh, it would be 
early in the um, early in the meeting rather than at the end. And this is a opportunity, again, for the HRB to speak directly to the council uh, about um, historic preservation issues um, that the board feels is important to bring up to the council. It also gives an opportunity for the council to ask questions of the board uh, about um, their processing and, and review. It's been a few years since we've had a joint meeting, but I do recall at the last meeting there was a sense that um, the city council was not uh, completely aware of the, the breadth and scope of the HRB's activities with regards to historic review. Um, so I think what we would like to maybe use this time for is to think about or discuss possible topics that we can share with the HRB. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, set assignments for individual board members perhaps to work together uh, in order to develop the materials that we might present to council on September 22nd. Uh, a model that we might want to consider is a recent joint meeting between the Architectural Review Board and the City Council. And the approach that the Architectural Review Board took was um, that um, they wanted to show council kind of their added value to the review process. And a lot of people see projects once they're constructed and built and react to the, to the finished product um, that is on the street. What the ARB did was show how projects evolved through the architectural review process from the initial proposal through the design changes as a result of the architectural review and then to the finished product. It's, I think, most of the HRB members would uh, agree that um, through this process a project can change quite significantly and that even though the finished product may not be completely loved and accepted by everybody, the changes from beginning to end through the historic review processes are very um, are very important and, and and actually show that there's a lot of value added by this board. Uh, and so that might be one way to go. I was thinking of a couple projects that uh, I think might visibly describe that. Uh, I think the Hoover Pavilion restoration um, is a, a good example of how a project evolved over time uh, and then symbolically adding the the finial at the end um, you know where everybody has said that that is the probably one of the most important pieces of that of that building um, is a uh, is something that you might want to consider promoting. Um, even though the project didn't move forward, um, the University Arts Building, I think, evolved quite a bit through the Historic Resources Board review. Um, and it might be interesting to show the befores and afters to the, um, to the council uh, that that might illustrate it. And there are probably many more. We don't have to limit ourselves to what has happened just in the past year. So if there are any other uh, projects that you think the board had a had a, uh, a, a good added good value to the process, then um, you can let us know, and we can pull materials together for you uh, uh, to uh, to perhaps come up with a presentation that might might be made to council. Yes. Uh, and in one of our last times when we uh, met with city council, and I'm can't put my hand on the piece of paper right now, but we did do a description of what the the um, job and mission of the the <coughs> HRB was. Just just some basic facts because we have had um, changes in the city council, and so there are people who've not really had a good even foundation of what we are able to and supposed to be doing. Right. So um, we will find that uh, piece of paper. And I, I think that's a good good comment. Um, it certainly um, is a good strategy to have the HRB tell its own story about who it is and, and what it does. And I think that could be done in a number of ways. You could do that simply in a kind of a one page, very visual or report or, um, or description about the HRB and, and what you do. And that might be something that could exist and live beyond a joint meeting. You know, whenever people say, well, well it's nice to meet you. What does the HRB do? You could say, well, here's a you know, a one-page description about all the things that we do. Uh, and another 
that um, occurred to me is I remember quite a while back when we were trying to pr uh, pass a, a, a revised preservation ordinance, there was um, a common statement that was put out many, many times that historic designation will ruin your property value. And for that reason, I brought in the most recent um, summary that appeared in the weekly about the median price uh, of houses within all of our areas. And interestingly enough, Professorville had the most valuable um, property value uh, above Crescent Park, above houses up in the hills, which typically have been the most valuable. And our houses have gone from, these happen to have been some of the Summer Hill uh, rehabilitation buildings, from buildings that look like this to a most recent uh, one of those buildings that's now for sale and highly desirable. So it, it in a way, uh, somewhat disproves this myth. In, in, in fact, it, it proves that people have gained value by saving and preserving historic homes. I think that's a great point, and I think that is a, a fine kickoff to perhaps some work that the board members could do, perhaps in a subcommittee level, to start to develop uh, some of these resources or examples um, that uh, where the HRB can tell its own story about what it does within the city and, and the value that it brings. And this is something that we could provide to council ahead of time uh, for their review um, so that when they come to the joint meeting, they'll have a sense about what the HRB actually actually does. So uh, perhaps board members can think about um, uh, forming a subcommittee who might be able to work on those those types of materials that that could educate the council before the meeting uh, and then second um, prepare materials that we can present at the joint meeting itself that might illustrate uh, in more uh, greater detail the value that they bring uh, one question here when is the is there an election coming up this fall? Uh, November November yeah. Yes. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be prudent to have this after the election so that we can brief the new new members? Yes, yes. probably a little of both. I mean, I, I think that it's always important for, um, you know, the boards to meet with, with the city council. Um, you know, I think it's the, you're, you would be talking with the city council who are the leaders of the city that will continue to be leaders probably in some way after uh, they, they leave council if, if that is the case. Uh, and so, you know, I could see us doing maybe a series of, of meetings. Maybe we have one, um, you know, in September and then we meet in the spring or summer of next year with the new members and kind of have a second, a second round at, at this. Uh, does any other board members have comments about the joint meeting and topics that we might want to discuss? Well, I think we probably could provide a list fairly easily. And um, when you get closer to a time, we could certainly provide, you know, some of us have been through several of the council meetings and have sort of, um, you know, it's good and bad. I mean, we get to meet the councilmen, we talk to them in this room here. and. Uh, I remember at one point we had a very defined defined um, presentation to be made, and we got about two two I know what twenty twenty percent of what we were going to present and then and the council just ended up having a, a large discussion between themselves, and we didn't really get to present our 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 program that we were hoping to do and I think a number of the board members were quite frustrated with that that um, and then there were a lot of things the council actually talked about that was somewhat incorrect, but we weren't able to respond in the meeting. And it was, it was, it was from a lot of us, it was a pretty frustrating <laughs> meeting because uh, it just, we didn't get our, we didn't get our message across and the message that came through 
we weren't exactly sure was correct. <laughs> well, I think the HRB has an opportunity now to uh, perhaps work on materials that could be presented to the City Council before the meeting uh, so that they can have a base understanding about what the HRB does and doesn't do. Uh, and then uh, instead of spending all that time trying to understand what the HRB does at the joint meeting, you can get into more substantial discussions. But that sounds like a good, good program. So I'll volunteer to be on a subcommittee to help arrange those topics. I'll volunteer. Okay, we, we have two members already. So um, when you form your first meeting, we'll see who else would like to come. Anything else? Stephen? Mm -hmm. um, nothing on this topic, unless okay. uh, board members have any other comments on. I may, I may join that meeting, uh, that committee, if uh, depending upon when it meets. Okay. We'll we'll keep you posted. <laughs> um, we don't really have a formal agenda today, so. Um, well, we can move on to the next item that uh, I had um, thought of is an update on the Professorville design guidelines okay and then Roger I think that you had a presentation that might be related well, to that yeah I, I uh, was asked by Joel Spohn at uh, Absolute Mortgage to um, uh, do a, me and two or three other uh, arc, one or other architect and two contractors gave a presentation to a bunch of real estate agents about what's going on here in Palo Alto and so um, I put together a, a series of slides, um, and Matthew in the office, and I, uh, and I thought I could present it today because it, um, it, it sort of goes through. I, it, it, what, all the photos are our work we've done, but the point of this was to talk about the varying um, zoning issues that we run into with homes, and there, there's a there is a section in there about the Professorville guidelines, which I talk about. So if you wanted to. I could run, th I'll run through this really quickly so it won't okay. take too long. Right, Thank you for doing that. <clears throat> so if we could. The, um, the uh, Adobe Acrobat document? There it is, yeah. Okay, great. Full screen. Full screen. Oh, okay. So this is the first cover of these. Uh, this is my staff or our Christmas cards. You can go to the next one right away. And, um, so this is a modern home in Palo Alto Hills. It's a uh, RE zone. And in the RE, it's residential estate zones in Palo Alto. The only, um, there, are, there is no um, individual review. There's no design rules. You comply with the zoning ordinance and you can build pretty much any home. Uh, there may be another picture, I don't know. but So then this is another uh, one in the RE zone in off Matadero in uh, Barron Park. And it is, there's a sketch. It's, it's nearing completion now. But again, this home had, did not go through the individual review program. And so the RE zone is kind of a sought-after zone right now because you're not required to go through the individual review program. For those listening, the IR or individual review program is required for all two-story home additions or new two-story homes in the R1 zone district. Now, I think we we'll go to the next one. We could start get some. And in, in, in one, in one, I put this in here because this is a home in Menlo Park. Menlo Park, if you if you are if your lot is meets the minimum requirement, in this case, 10,000 square feet, there is no design review. If you're less than 10,000 square feet in Menlo Park, you go through a very rigid uh, design re review, which neighbors are notified. And um, I don't want to be too negative about it, but in Menlo Park, if there are enough neighbors come out and complain, I call it vigilante zoning, your home, you can't build your home. And it's been through three of them, and it's not a very pleasant site. So this is a home that complied with all the lot sizes and was built. And you can see on the left there is the below grade patio, which is lar larger than 200 square feet that were allowed in Menlo Park. So you can go to the next picture. So that's about, so in Atherton, the same thing. You there's basically no rule 
about uh, what the house looks like. There are limits on sizes, but as you can see here are two fairly large homes that uh, would be almost impossible to do here in Palo Alto because of the individual review program. And I'm not saying this is good or bad, but I'm just as an example. So let's go to the next one. So in Los Altos, they have a, they have a program where uh, any home over on two stories does go through the in, a design review process through staff. There's not a, that's not a called program. And both these homes went through this, to the city council and were approved. And recently in the paper, there's been a, a large home in Los Altos that it got approved. And the city council said they were required to approve it because of the zoning ordinance, which is a first for me because the city council has made many demands on home designs, especially two-story homes in Los Altos. And for them to sort of just say, well, it met the zoning ordinance, we're going to approve it, was very surprising. Let's go to the next one. This one here is in Oakland Hills. The only reason I have this here is because this is right after the fire. And this is when I met Arnold Malmoralia, who's our uh, um, individual review consultant. And on the left side is a picture of the bay window in the nook. And it's over on the right picture. It's in the far right side. Arnold was objecting to the fact that the bay window was all glass and not didn't fit the other windows. And I said to Arnold, I says, who's going to see this house? I mean, literally, it's a cliff. <laughs> It drops off and it looks straight out at the Oakland, uh, you know, Bay Bridge. And so, anyway, that's just it's kind of a sidelight that I've known Arnold now over 20 years. So I can go to the next. So here's Professorville, and this was right. Uh, this was done at the beginning of the year. And so here's some comments about um, the guideline booklet, which I have here, which we are working on. I guess we'll talk about that today. Is that correct? We, yeah. And this was an explanation of um, a combination of the individual review program and Professorville. In the upper right-hand corner is a sample of a home that not, would not be approved because the neighboring homes are one-story Eichler-type homes, and the, the house in the middle is a large two-story box. The guidelines have been um, put in place to try to avoid this kind of discrepancy between neighboring homes. And in Professorville, um, the guidelines are going to be kind of reworked a little bit to apply more to um, the historic structures in um, Professorville. Go on to the next one, I think. And so in the individual review, these are uh, some homes that uh, the Elevation 1 in the upper left-hand corner was our first proposal for a home on 2nd Street down off of East West Meadow. And through working with staff and um, the consulting architect, Elevation 2 is the one that was uh, finally uh, approved. And you can see the difference is really quite dramatic that the Second floor, on Elevation 1, it's a fairly large two-story looking home where on the Elevation 2, you can see the horizontal line of the porch and this reduction of the width of the second floor that it, it's going to uh, probably relate quite a bit better to the individual, the one-story homes on each side. The neighbors did object to this design and appealed to the city council and this is it. You, you have that option to appeal to the city council, and the city council um, did not really even hear it, so they just, uh, without hearing it, they just approved the project. Let's go to the next one. I think we're almost. Did you say approved or disapproved? They didn't. The, the, no, the, the neighbor objected and appealed to the city council to have that design changed. City council, the way they do it is they. They either vote to look at it or not. They decide not to look at it, which meant that it would um, stand as it was approved. This is a home on Harker. We worked with um, uh, staff quite a bit. It, you, again, you can see the horizontal porches on each side of a front feature. And the second floor is set back, so that does relate to the one-story homes around each side. This was a project where on the, on the left side, the, there were small windows in the master bathroom that at one point 
the that were frosted glass and the neighbor next door was very upset about the fact that they could open so during the construction uh, Amy French and Stephen O'Connell came out from the planning department and it was decided that these windows would be bolted shut <laughs> so now the what used to be little kit windows open so the individual review program has I think really responded to the neighbors concerns and privacy especially is a, a high priority in that program uh, as an example maybe go to the next picture I'm not sure what the next one is but so here's a home again in the flood zone and you, you see the trend again with the large horizontal porch and the second floor being pushed back and in this case the finished floor is almost four feet above grade and that's that's a becomes a problem in flood zone districts when the original homes on each side don't comply with the flood zone requirement of being above the level of the water potential water flow um, so okay go to the next one and this one was recently sold and again it's in a large on Hamilton Avenue it's a larger home but again the large horizontal line of the porch and the second floor being pushed back um, I think that's uh, let's see what else there is I guess the the object of this whole thing is that this program will be is now being folded into the um, Professorville area to implement a lot of these controls that are here in the individual review for all other homes in the Professorville this is a little larger home in um, off Newell Road and uh, you can see it's been pushed back and again the horizontal roof lines and the uh, um, um, and actually a lot of the homes are further, set back further than the other homes as well and I don't think there's any more let's see what <coughs> um, another home on Harker go ahead and you can get in the porch up oh, that's it so the point of the program was to explain to the um, real estate agents about how this individual review program goes and so it was interesting because the professor Ville did come up in the discussion with these realtors about oh it's a tough place to look at homes and how do we do it we don't know what what can be done what can't be done so our discussion today will be on a review of this uh, program that's uh, I think worked out pretty well and the consulting ar uh, architect uh, Arnold Mamarelia will be part of the Professorville program as well. Now, is that that's correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's correct, uh, Roger. Thank you very much for for that presentation. I think you um, really touched on I think the one of the key aspects of the Professorville design guidelines is that early on the Professorville committee um, felt that and decided that the Professorville guidelines should be a part of the individual review guidelines uh, specifically for Professorville. The committee felt that the individual review guidelines in the program was very successful and that the guidelines could be uh, enhanced by having additional considerations specifically for Professorville and that was the the committee's um, kind of task in moving forward and coming up with the guidelines that are in the draft book uh, that you um, that you have today just a bit of a recent background the board reviewed the booklet and the proposed guidelines at their meeting in December it was December 18th uh, and the board had a very good discussion uh, about a number of items relating to the proposed guidelines. Um, I think the board overall felt that the the guidelines, the the Professorville guidelines, uh, were very good uh, as a whole, but had some questions uh, on um, kind of surrounding issues that I think relate to development in Professorville uh, in general. There was a question about cumulative impacts to the district, whereby small projects come in, take little bites out of historic resources that could then affect the individual property as a resource and then over time affect the district uh, as a whole. And I think the board felt like if there is anything that the guidelines can do to help address those cumulative impacts over time, uh, that that could be a, a, a good addition. As Roger mentioned, um, you know, uh, education of real estate agents and real estate professionals with regards to the um, 
the requirements of Professorville, the board felt that that was that could be a very important opportunity to educate real estate professionals uh, about uh, Professorville itself, the district, what it is, and what the requirements are. Um, the the guideline document doesn't go into a lot of background uh, about Professorville, and it doesn't get deep into the the individual zoning and processing requirements, um, although uh, part of the guidelines includes a recommendation to come to the HRB very early on in the process, uh, and that is which has been shown to be beneficial to both homeowners and, and architects and to the city to have an early review of, uh, of that. But it's a guideline, it's not a requirement um, uh, as part of this. Uh, I'm sorry, yes? One further thing in this. Uh area of really preparing people early. Is it possible for real estate agents or prospective buyers to come and ask in depth what regulations would apply to a specific property? Yes. In fact, staff gets those requests on a weekly basis. Um, just this week, um, uh, you know, we uh, have fielded at least uh, two calls with regards to properties that are for sale uh, in Professorville, and uh, they inquired about the process uh, that would be required for for review. And so, staff has worked very closely with those uh, callers, with those real estate agents and prospective buyers about the about the rules and and, and regulations. Um, so, um, to the extent perhaps that the that the guideline document could be enhanced to include some some basic information um, that uh, would be helpful to new property owners. Uh, perhaps that's an addition that we can make to the to the guideline document moving forward. Um, there was other comments relating to enforcement um, of the guidelines. Um, we staff responded that uh, we felt that we have a pretty good enforcement mechanism by which uh, there is a process to review building permit plans for consistency with the individual review guidelines. Um, that if during construction, if projects are not built consistent with those plans, that the city has the opportunity to stop a project uh, and find out what the issues and problems are. And then if there are issues, have the um, have the homeowner make corrections to the to the on-site uh, construction, um, or come and revise their plans in a way that's consistent with zoning. So we felt that uh, enforcement generally is is good, uh, but one of the um, one of the improvements that the board has recommended for a number of years now is the addition of a slip sheet uh, into building permit pages, much like our current slip sheets for. Um, for uh, protected trees and for um, public works, um, I think uh, water uh, water protection, um, that they have slip sheets that are, are in each uh, that are in each building permit set that provide an overview of what's required of the builder and the contractor uh, going forward. And we could have a similar page for historic resources specifically to say that you know if you are considering any changes beyond what's approved in these plans that you have to go back through the process. And, and it, it, it highlights to property owners and builders that the historic issues are as important as any other code issue relating to the project. Um, so um, that's something I think that we can follow up with kind of separate from the guidelines, but the board felt that that was, that, that that was important. Um, there was other comments with regard to um, kind of the definition of, the, of a historic district, uh, and I think the guidelines go into uh, some description of Professorville and, and why and how it's important, but um, there was a few comments saying that the that the historic district itself could be better defined in terms of what makes it special uh, as a as a district, um, and that the guidelines could be enhanced to uh, to include that. There was a few comments about um, can these guidelines be tr uh, transferred or applied to other historic districts in town, and I think the response was that these guidelines are so specific to Professorville that they would not translate easily to the city's other historic historic districts such as the Ramona Street Commercial District uh, and the two Eichler uh, National Districts um, uh, that are in the south part of the city. 
um, perhaps some guidelines could be developed for those individual districts, but um, it was felt, I think, that these guidelines are specifically designed and tailored for, per for Professorville, and they could not be easily um, applied to, to any other part of the, of the city. Incentives were also brought up as a topic. Um, uh, including, you know, are there ways where the city can uh, incentivize the preservation and restoration of, of buildings? The Mills Act was brought up as a possible incentive. Uh, the city has been reluctant in the past to um, move forward with Mills Act, I think because of um, our one and only Mills Act property of the Squire House. Um, there may not be a full understanding that the city has control over Mills Act in terms of of, of the the amount of tax incentives that are given, the length of time of those tax incentives. Perhaps there's an opportunity, maybe not to have tax incentives go throughout the life of the of the property, but for a, a more specific defined period. Um, so I think there are ways that the Mills Act could be explored, um, but the city, in its history, has been reluctant to 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 apply the Mills Act broadly across the city. Oh yes. Um, as a comment, I've said this before at board meetings, San Francisco has a Mills Act program that I think Palo Alto should review and uh, um, modify and then adopt. They will give you a 10-year um, property tax reduction. You pay a f substantial amount to actually go through the process. Mm -hmm. You don't get more than 50% reduction and at the end of 10 years, you have to come back and do the process again. So I think Palo Alto's experience with the Squire House is actually the worst kind of experience for a city to have because it was not well understood to thought out 25 years ago or 30 years ago. It took a very expensive property and reduced the property taxes to almost nothing at a time when, yeah, in perpetuity, at a time when the school districts needed the funds. In my neighborhood, which is a Crescent Park neighborhood, there are three properties I can think of that have been um, completely redeveloped. And the property taxes on two of them were something in the tune of uh, $1,800. One of the properties is just sold for $5.6 million. So the property tax went from 1800 a year to $67,000 a year. So... And the project, the house that was torn down, was one of the early 20th century houses, the cottages that are ubiquitous in the northern part of the city and are being demolished every single year at a, an astounding rate. So we're going to lose part of the historic character of our city because there's no incentive for anybody to save those buildings. They don't register on an historic scale, um, yet they're part of the fabric of Palo Alto. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for Palo Alto now with this extraordinarily high property tax rates that result when these new projects are sold to use the Mills Act to, as an incentive to save some of these properties that we, uh, otherwise we'll lose them all. Not just the Professorville properties, but really think of um, a broader sense of what older Palo Alto mostly northern, um, has to offer the city. Do, do board members have any uh, thoughts about the Mills Act? Uh, you'd like to contribute? I remember when I first came on the board, the Mills Act was a pretty hot issue, and we talked about it. And I remember going out to see <clears throat> at least one home off of university, between university and the creek, and then there was, uh, I think we went up to Redwood City and uh, looked at a home that had been built. The Redwood City had a very active Mills Act program. And it was um, near downtown. It was a smaller home, and it was being refinished. And um, this was, you know, a long time ago. But it seems like over the years we hit and miss talk about the Mills Act. It's not... Um, doesn't seem to come up very often. So um, it's probably time to do that. Uh, so, uh, we, I believe the city has a facade easement on the Squire House. Now, is that part of the Mills Act or is that separate from? Because actually some of the front 
interior rooms are protected and and that really had not been done anywhere around that is part of the Mills Act okay um, but is you know something to consider I, I, there are times when we look at some of these properties and think oh this is such a grand entry hall or major f front room that is you couldn't build these days and um, to have some of that ability could be very valuable because the the it's happening all over town everything inside is wiped out and and you lose something and and of course another thing about the Mills Act which I think is very important is that um, the property owner in is supposed to each year open the property in some way for the public to yeah. see and that is a huge public benefit that I think we need to keep Well, what about it? So, do you have Mills Acts there? Oh no, absolutely. That's oh. not <laughs> not even doesn't even uh, <laughs> register. <laughs> <laughs> not on that radar. <laughs> but uh, that's right. Okay. It, it's, it seems like there's a cultural bias in Palo Alto against the Mills Act for reasons that aren't really well founded today, anyways. Well, uh, and the one of real is had school yeah. support. Yeah, well, school, yes, yeah, school support, but I mean, with as you pointed out, David, with the increased property values here, that problem I can't, I can't possibly believe it exists. The school district always has a deficit and yeah. never has enough money. I mean, it it just seems like there's a, a bias in this community that others other townships do, do not municipalities do not have. And I, I think we should go back and take a look at that. Yeah. Um, so just because, uh, for example, there are a lot of incentives for historic preservation. It's called the home improvement exception process. I think there's something like, what, 11 or 15 different home improvement exceptions you can apply for for historic property. So adding some, as uh, Board Member Bauer just mentioned, uh, if you just have a little more uh, tighter uh, limits of what Mills Act can give, for example, don't make it in perpetuity, but make it a limited time. <clears throat> um, City Council could <clears throat> make a comment about the limit of property tax that's redu reduced, so that could address any school uh, issues. Um, and just have it as another mix, uh, in, in the mix of possibilities. Uh, city Council has to approve a Mills Act contract, right? So the city still has control, um, so it could be on the books as, as allowable, but the city still has ultimate control over where, whether it gets accepted or adopted or, or not. So, And then referring to the bias, I don't know if it's, is it a community bias or is it some other bias? Yeah, yeah. thank you. other thing that has been really I think in many ways Dennis Backlund has been our almost the architect of recovering from the loss of the changing changing the preservation ordinance has been to go around the other way and rather make than making it a law you must do making it it's a good deal to preserve you get extra floor area you don't have to count certain areas um, you um, there there's the transfer of development rights in some instances so that those incentives I feel have been extremely successful in part of this turnaround of preservation becoming more acceptable to the general public well I think part of it is 
what price do you want to pay to maintain the character, unique character of the community? And I think the, the, the price you pay for allowing things like the Mills Act is rather minor, and the benefits you get out of it are huge. The folks who are working on topics for the joint meeting with City Council may want to consider uh, testing the waters, perhaps, with the Council uh, about um, perhaps this topic. And the, maybe the subcommittee working on those joint meeting topics can kind of think about the pros and cons of uh, whether or not this is the right time to think about that incentive to, to discuss with Council. Um, so uh, maybe that's something the subcommittee can work on. Uh, kind of a side comment is that the, um, in some ways, the creation of the individual review guidelines and uh, the process that goes through for any two-story home has had a major impact on the general look of Palo Alto. And when in, as some of the homes I showed showed that we've done, you just drive around town, and the the quality of the new homes has really gone up dramatically. There aren't too many two-story boxes with a little three-foot door in the, around anymore that the, these, the, the, the guidelines have created a, um, I think, a pretty substantial change in the overall character of homes in Palo Alto. And the goal here is to try to make sure that can happen in Professorville as well, and which is, I think we've been pretty lucky in Professorville overall, but there's still a lot of homes out there especially in the area that was added on to, which I know some people have questioned whether or not this should have been part of Professorville, but it is. So now this is all has to fall into the place here. Well, um, one, uh, in terms of next steps, what happened at the December 18th meeting was uh, a continuance of this item. Uh, the HRB uh, directed uh, staff to uh, prepare comments from that meeting, uh, prepare minutes, uh, send those to our two uh, board members on the Professorville Committee, so that's board members Kohler and Bernstein, um, to review. We would also accept uh, email comments from individual board members about any other issue that wasn't discussed at the, uh, at the meeting uh, to consider. Uh, and then uh, Roger and Martin would then convene the Professorville Committee to talk about any final adjustments uh, that, uh, that could be made to the guidelines. That would be followed by a community meeting uh, to present kind of the draft final document for any further consideration. It would then return back to the HRB for um, a recommendation to the City Council. Um, so, uh, you know, due to, I think, some priority shifts in the planning department, we just have not been able to spend as much time on the guidelines the first half of this year as we would have liked. But I think we're in a good place now, whereby if uh, Martin and Rogers, our two Professorville Committee members, um, could collect the comments from the HRB, collect the comments from the minutes, and then work on some proposed changes that could be presented to the Professorville community, uh, and then um, get those changes, if accepted, into the document, uh, and then go back through the public process of a community meeting and HRB meeting before going on to City Council. And I think those, uh, that's, those are steps that could happen uh, pretty quickly, um, so that perhaps in the fall time frame, um, we could have that community meeting and the HRB meeting uh, and then have the, the guidelines go to council sometime near the end of the year. Um, so um, if there's any other comments on that, then I think what staff will do is we'll work to collate those December 18th comments, provide verbatim minutes to, to Roger and Martin, and then we can work together <coughs> on presenting those findings to the, to the full committee. Um, okay, I guess... Um... So, but basically the, the rough draft that we have in this booklet is the outcome of the last uh, meetings or what did we, I, I sort of lost that track here. The there's no, there's been no changes to that document since December 18th. Okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, we, the next version will be the version that I think ultimately comes back to the HRB for a recommendation. Because I know one of the things was which, which homes to 
use as guides in the in here and I see there are a number of various pictures and things. Right. There was also comments that some of the pictures could be adjusted too. So um, you know that uh, if if board members still have those thoughts about the the guidelines, um, you, you could send those over to to Roger and and, and to Martin. But um, I think Roger Martin and the committee will kind of take a top to bottom review of the document again and make sure that it's the right document to move forward. Okay. All right. I think there's one other formal item, perhaps, oh. just that I wanted to discuss in terms of upcoming meetings with the HRB and, and, and actual projects that we're reviewing. We have three projects that we see coming before the board in, in the future. Oh. Um, one of them is the Varsity Theater. Um, you may have uh, recalled that the prior project that the board reviewed, which was a restaurant, um, did not happen. The owners of the restaurant decided not to um, to exercise their option on the, on the space. Um, so the, the varsity has remained um, remained vacant uh, and really no changes have been made. Um, a new application has been submitted to the city um, by SAP Corporation that wants to uh, turn the, the ground floor back into a cafe that's open to the public, um, a co-working space um, where people can get together and discuss ideas uh, and a presentation area where um, the public would be invited uh, to presentations that would be given uh, mainly around I think tech topics and and things like that but it's there it's the first of SAP's idea about um, having a space that is very connected to the community and the environment in the city of which it's in to be able to share ideas um, and uh, to provide people with a space um, to, uh, to share those ideas and, and communicate uh, with, with the public. It's focused mainly on a cafe, so the courtyard would remain open um, and people would be allowed to come in and sit and, and use the internet and, and have something to eat. Um, uh, but also there would be a formal program um, that would uh, allow co-working spaces for people who don't generally work in offices uh, to come and meet um, and uh, and then also again third uh, more of a presentation area where uh, presentations to the public and, and to the tech community would, would occur. Um, they are trying to have a very light touch to the building itself so they're not proposing uh, any uh, an exterior changes um, they want to help restore what's there. Um, on the inside, I think they're trying to get a, a light touch as well, um, where they would have flexible spaces where um, desks and presentation areas could be moved around depending on the need. Um, but um, uh, since the building was uh, had a historic renovation and rehabilitation, uh, and an EIR produced, it makes sense for the HRB to review those changes, both any changes on the external portions of the building and internally as well. Um, so an application has been submitted. Um, I, I believe that soon, uh, if it's not up there already, you'll be able to go onto the city's website and see the plans and the project description for that. Um, and then in, I think, August, uh, in the late August meeting, the applicant wants to come to the board and make the presentation and, and seek a recommendation. So, so yes. Quick question. Um, they must have other office space nearby. That obviously, they're not, if they're going to, it sounds like most of this space is going to be public. It, their intent is to make this a very public space. SAP has offices in Palo Alto up um, above the research park. Um, and so this this is not going to be an SAP office. They're they're trying very hard to make this as open to the public as as possible. Um, and so yeah, we'll see that. Yes, Beth. Uh, and are they allowed to, uh, or did they like get any rights to uh, the decisions that were made on the former project, such as the the retractable roof over the the uh, outdoor area those are still valid um, the property owner uh, wants to keep those discretionary entitlements um, they've asked for a 12-month extension on their um, entitlements they received their entitlements about a year or so ago and they haven't exercised them um, they have um, they you can ask for a one-year extension um, which they have um, but SAP uh, from what I understand about the project, does not want to move forward with the roof. 
um, and that that would be kept open. And my sense is that they also do not want to have the glass storefront that would be on University Avenue as well. Um, so um, they're they're seeing the courtyard as remaining as is, um, and but the property owner itself would like to kind of retain those entitlements for at least another another year. Um, so. So that's the status of the of the previous. Thank you so there. much. That's it. So um, so that's the that's the varsity theater coming to you, and then two smaller residential projects uh, on Amherst. Um, there's a category two that is having a house addition. Um, again, since the cat's a category two, the HRB is required to review that project. There's a home improvement exception that would be requested for for that site. And then on Kipling, uh, a Category 2 Professorville House, the board has seen this request on a study session. This is the request to actually rotate the house on the site um, to better use the, the site for yard space, but also to create um, uh, better setbacks between um, the adjacent home, uh, I believe, on Kipling. Um, and so that is going through the staff review process now, um, but that's expected to come to the board uh, on August 6th. Is, is that a... Is that house actually sold? I saw it. I don't think the house is actually sold. I think there is an agreement between the proposed property owner and the current property owner uh, to, um, to kind of go through this process before the sale is, is made. Is that process a home improvement exception or a variance? Um, they uh, are not seeking... Um, well, they'll, they'll, they will actually have, they will actually need a HIE, um, it's been determined, and individual review process for that house. Um, not that they're increasing the height or the massing or anything, but I, staff has determined that since they are doing a substantial move, that it would be best to recognize the, the height that's already there now, but also go through the process of individual review. Well, by moving the house, you're changing the impact on neighbors dramatically. So, in in this case, probably in a good way, but it still means you have to have it reviewed. So that's right. Yeah. Okay. So the board will have to make findings that the project is consistent with the secretary standards, and we will uh, pr provide that analysis in the staff report for that meeting. Okay. So that's the um, the few projects that will be coming to the board. Again, I think um, August will we expect to have probably at least both meetings in in August. Um, that's the sixth and the twentieth, I believe. Yeah. How about this coming two weeks from today? No, we won't. We have no items for the meeting on the seventeenth. Okay. And then I think that might be the last item. Oh, just really quick, um, HRB member biographies. I, I mentioned that the city clerk's office, um, you know, has a request to get biographies, and they would like to take all board members' photographs. Um, I think they had identified the next meeting on the 17th, but since we're not having that, then um, we'll use the meeting as the 6th, where the, the clerk can come and take photographs of, I think, of the board, and then each of you as individuals. So. Okay. It's picture day for the HRB, When's that? <laughs> and August? that would probably be August on the August sixth meeting. Okay. Um, and I think um, the clerk's office has reached out to you individually about the biographies and uh, what they're hoping to get from you. Okay. And then I think that is it. So, any other items for the board to discuss? Yes, Mark. Yes, um, I've been thinking about this for a couple years. Um, to have a, I, this probably needs to be agendized. I think. Uh, you could, Steve, you can let me know if that, let the board know if it needs to be agendized. Um, to uh, reduce the number of historic categories from four categories to one category. So if it's historic, it's historic. If it's historic, it ties into the ordinance. If it's not historic, it's, um, to simplify, just make things more predictable for homeowners. And if it's, I mean, it's, the ordinance is still in effect. Just make one category instead of four. What's the difference? Hmm. Hmm. Simplification. Does the, the ordinances do not get impacted. Well, what was what was the rationale for having the four different categories initially? We have to put on well. The, the, yeah, it, it's been around a long time. Mm -hmm. but, uh, there must have been some thought put into that why we had that. I I think at the time it was um, 
I think possibly there were a, a, a lot, a, quite a number of, a large number of homes that were historic with a wide range of quality, and maybe they felt that they had to have these four categories. There's certainly a, a distinction between category one and two properties and three and four properties that the ones and twos tend to be um, seen uh, very similarly. Um, there's not much difference in processing between ones and twos. There is a lot of difference between the ones and twos and threes and fours. Like for instance, the, the board is required to review all one and two properties. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're in a, a historic district, you have to review one, two, threes, and fours. But if you are a category three and four and not in a historic district, there is um, not a lot of protection for those for those properties unless CEQA yeah. gets involved. Yeah, so if there's no protection, on it, just to use your words, then why even have it listed? You know, let's just make it, make it a purer system. Historic has preservation. If it's not historic, do what you want. But there is another factor as well, which was when those categories were set up, they were set up basically on the basis of architecture. And since then, the Secretary of Interior Standards have changed and, and there are other considerations like what happened here, what effect did this, did an important person live here, was it done by an important architect. None of those factors, as far as, as what I've read and understood, were being considered when the categories were set up. So the, the, it's not only what's happened here, but what has happened nationally in terms of our understanding and the Secretary's standards. So, so I think it you know, would take very close consideration. Yeah, so that could support the idea of not having four categories. look very carefully at a lot of the properties. Yeah, that would need to be an agendized item for us to debate. I this. think uh, to, um, to certainly have a, a motion or a recommendation to move forward, it would need to be an agendized uh, okay. item, certainly. But we can, if that's something that um, board member Bernstein you'd like to do, I would probably encourage you to work through uh, Chair Kohler um, to discuss that and then uh, Chair Kohler can work with city staff to find an appropriate agenda date for for that discussion. Okay, so perhaps nope. there could be some uh, a a HRB member report or a memo that that you yeah, perhaps probably, is the sponsor. Yeah, probably be a modest a modest report, one page kind of item about our suggestion. Maybe we could we can get one more member involved and not be a not be a summary. So Correct. someone else. Okay, so just to close this item so the, the next step would be we have to produce something in written okay i would think you might probably want to work through the chair uh, to okay. discuss this item and then okay. the chair can work with staff to find an agenda date okay thank you okay can I? yeah i think you'd want to somehow get pros and cons on this and also well, yeah. look at what similar communities practices are well, it may take more than just a. It's little, more, but 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 maybe it, it, it to jumpstart it, it might mean that we are recognizing that this. Once we get it on the agenda and discuss it as a board, we can make we don't make a decision, but we decide possibly as a board we want to pursue this item, and then we would create substantial, you know, other documents to support it. So change. I mean, it's first I heard of it, but I, I, I just the point I'm making just don't jump into something without. Well, no, I think the process is. Did I, have you ever seen Palo Alto jump into anything? <laughs> it's unheard of. I'll let you mention it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. Uh, well, maybe if we really think about it, there were a few items, but we won't go into that now. I have a question for Stephen. Stephen, uh, any okay. News on the Palo Alto Post Office uh, purchase. Uh, no new news. The uh, the uh, post office at the federal level, I think, is still considering their options. Uh, they've heard the city's latest offer uh, and are considering um, 
you know, kind of their, their options at this moment. So no, nothing new to report. Okay. Uh, let's see, anything else for comments? Uh, so the next meeting is going to be in um, August. August 6th. August 6th, and we'll see you then. If there's nothing else, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you for all coming today, and we'll see you next time. Smell the marshmallow. Once you smell the marshmallow, you're done. <laughs>